The Triassic world, a world of recovery from the worst mass extinction in history that killed up to 75% of life on land, that's the world in which we find Drapanosaurus. Across the equator, as recovery started to happen, new rainforests were starting to develop, and those trees provided ample habitat for many different species. And along that equatorial region is really where we find Drapanosaurus and its closest relatives. And the relatives had at least a bit of variation. They weren't all quite like Drapanosaurus. So there's first of all Drapanosaurus coming from Italy and the United States. There's also Hyperonectar from the United States, Kyrgyzsaurus from Kyrgyzstan, and Skybalonyx from actually pretty close to me at Petrified Forest. Just in case you needed more evidence that yeah, these things were mostly hanging around in forests. But as you saw from those images, they weren't all exactly the same. There's some variation in this group. And Drapanosaurus is just the first one we found, and the first real good look we got at their bizarre anatomy. And the thing is, even among the Drapanosaurs, Drapanosaurus might be the most bizarre. First, at the end of the tail, there's a little hook made out of fused vertebrae, that just all cemented together and turned into one single larger bone. But that's not what I named this video for, because the arms are much stranger, and for those concerned, I will get to the tail a little bit later, but first again, the arms, because they are... They are ridiculous. Arms are normally pretty easy to understand, even in the fossil record. There's things like the abelosaurs, dinosaurs which had very small arms, but even those are easy to understand. You still have the fingers, and sure they lost the wrist bones, but then you still have most of the other parts of the arm anatomy. There's finger bones, there's the radius and ulna, and the humerus. It all makes perfect sense. Then again you have things like snakes, where they don't have any limbs, which Again, pretty easy to understand. They just don't have any, and evolutionary pressure caused them to just lose them. Straightforward enough. And then you have things like frogs. Frogs are actually really interesting, because they actually have radius and ulna that are fused. So essentially, they had the two separate bones like we have in our forearm, and they fused it into just one single bone. They actually did the same thing to the legs too, with the fibula and tibia. But again, that's a later video maybe. Even horses are somewhat different, but pretty easy to understand. They're running on just one finger. Two of the other fingers became long splints of bone to help stabilize that, but the rest of the anatomy is pretty straightforward. And then you have Drapanosaurus. And Drapanosaurus is... <sighs> it's just so bizarre. I don't know how to quite explain it without just showing you. So we're going to start at the top where you have the humerus. There's some large crests and processes for giving it stronger arm muscles, which makes enough sense. Okay, cool. We scan down a little bit and we get to the ulna, which is a giant blade. It's pretty flat, but it would be really great for holding some really strong hand muscles. Okay, well, let's go to the radius, which is almost perpendicular to the ulna. Like when we think about this in human bones, we can see that the radius and the ulna are basically parallel. This is not that at all. This is entirely different. And in fact, that's pretty different from almost every other animal, other than a few other Drapanosaurs. So they're doing something really unique with that. And with that in mind, we can actually see how the radius and ulna both connect to the humerus, means it's not going to be able to actually pivot very well. So like, I can bend my elbow. Drapanosaurus really wouldn't have been able to pivot its elbow quite as much. And then we get to the wrist bones, and the wrists are kind of complete baloney. So there's a lot of bones, like in humans we have eight separate bones in our wrist. But that's not what happens with Trypanosaurs because they fused many of those. The same way that frogs fused their radius and ulna, same thing only with wrist bones. And that can give it a lot of stability, but it also has a few other limitations, especially on movement. But it can make those movements really, really strong. There is an issue where a lot of these bones though aren't super well preserved, so we're not sure of exactly which ones actually fused into the other ones. Hopefully we'll get some more fossils of this, and there are some new fossils even still coming out that haven't been fully described yet, so there is a chance we'll get a better understanding of this in the future. But right now it's just, no, they took a lot of their wrist bones and just pushed them together. We don't know exactly what the process was that led to that. And then we get to the fingers, and we're thinking, oh, okay, at least the fingers will be normal. Except they're still not. Because Drapanosaurus, as you probably saw in some of the images earlier, had a single giant claw on its second digit. And when we're talking about numbering digits, it's the hum is one, and then you have two, three, four, five. So this one on Drapanosaurus was extremely large. And then we also have some of its relatives that suggest that some of its other fingers that weren't preserved in Drapanosaurus would still be at least a little bit unique. 
specifically in Megalinkosaurus, which was preserved with its fingers intact and actually shows they would have formed kind of a chameleon-like mitten, I guess is one way to describe it, where there'd be three toes on one side, two toes opposed to that on the other side, and that would have helped them to be able to climb trees and things. And these two animals, Drapanosaurus and Megalankosaurus, both come from Italy. And actually there's another one, Valosaurus, which also comes from Italy. And it's really interesting because they almost form this kind of grade into one another. And unfortunately, a lot of these were at the same time, so it's hard to say for sure they were a grade or how related they were, but it seems like Valosaurus was the first diverging, and it doesn't really have that kind of tail spike, and doesn't really have as large of claws. Meanwhile, Megalankosaurus is starting to get a larger claw and has a smaller tail spike, and Trypanosaurus is the most extreme in all of these characteristics. Again, the largest relative claw size of these three species, and also the largest tail tip for actually trying to be able to hook it into trees and actually hang on using that tail. Because even the tail of Valosaurus does seem to be somewhat prehensile. So it still probably was doing some gripping, just without that extra tail spike to help give it a little extra grip. And as for the giant claws in Drapanosaurus, it seems like they were probably really good for digging into wood, and the strong hand muscles and arm musculature really helps to suggest that, that it would be really great at digging. And it seems like these claws may have been really great for digging into wood, and that's one of the ideas that a lot of people have proposed, that maybe it was kind of like a pygmy anteater, which do climb trees, and also have large claws for getting into ant and termite mounds. The thing is though, when Trypanosaurus was around, there weren't ants and termites yet, they wouldn't evolve for another 50 million years or so, which does suggest that maybe that's not the correct answer. However, I do think it was still probably likely that it was digging into wood, and instead of looking for things like ants, it was looking for things like grubs. Because the thing is, woodpeckers do basically that. They fly from place to place, they land on a tree, they burrow a hole into it, and pull out whatever grub is inside. The thing is though, we're really unsure about how well Drapanosaurus would have been able to actually get into those holes the same way a woodpecker would do. Because woodpeckers do that by having a very long tongue. And the thing is, while the skull of Drapanosaurus is pretty bird-like, it doesn't seem to have the same kind of musculature setups that we would expect for something that is more like a woodpecker. Now, Drapanosaurus itself wasn't actually preserved with a skull, but many of the other Drapanosaurs were, which means we can start applying what we know of them to Drapanosaurus. And the thing is, Megalankosaurus, which again is pretty similar other than having some of those features be a bit smaller, really helps to show that it probably didn't. There's one bone which may be the hyoid, and the hyoid is what all of the tongue muscles attach to. So if you want a really strong tongue for being able to reach into wood and pull out insects, you want a good strong hyoid. And it's not very large or strong in Megalankosaurus. And of course, it's easy to say, hey, maybe Drapanosaurus did have a different shaped skull. But the thing is, it's not just Megalankosaurus that had this bird-like skull. There's also Avacranium, literally bird skull, except it's a Drapanosaur. And this one comes from North America. There's also the animal Proto-Avis, which some people have said is the first bird, and other people have said, no, it's a dinosaur, some people have said, no, it's a collection of things, and some people have said, no, it's actually a Drapanosaur. So there's a wide collection of different things that do seem to be Drapanosaurs that have bird-like skulls. It's not limited to just one or two of them. It seems to be pretty consistent across the group. And that means it's really hard to say exactly what Drapanosaurus was doing. And the thing is, that's been pretty consistent across the group. For example, the one from New Jersey, Hyperonectar, was found to have a really broad tail and was actually suggested that it was probably swimming in the lake sediments it was found in, except then we found out that it doesn't have the kind of musculature and attachment points on that tail for it to be able to actually swim well. It's not a big flat paddle tail, it's instead just a large flat paddle. But the thing is, some people have actually proposed some ideas as to how that could have worked. Specifically by looking at gliding geckos, and that's because if the gecko falls off a tree, it uses its tail to rotate its body, and maybe Hyperonectar was just doing the same thing. It's somewhat outlandish, and until we get really good soft tissue preservation, we're probably not ever going to know that for sure, but it did have a seemingly similar pad-like fingers, meaning it may have been climbing like a chameleon in trees, and if it needed to get from place to place, that's one way to do it. Additionally, Hyperonectar seems to have diverged earlier, meaning it didn't have quite the same funky arm morphology as things like Drapanosaurus. 
Instead, it just had longer forelimbs, which is weird, except when you're looking at certain skeletons of modern animals. For example, the flying squirrel, which also in general has similarly length or slightly longer forelimbs. And that's in order to help hold up the wing so that it can actually glide from tree to tree. So maybe Hyperonectar was actually one of the first gliding animals. This makes sense when we look at where it shows up in some phylogenies, and I want to say importantly, some phylogenies. Because some phylogenies have the Drapanosaurs as sister group to another group of gliding animals from the Triassic, the Cahuasauridae, which were more lizard-like, but maybe just gliding was ancestral to both these groups. And then later as things like Drapanosaurus became more attached to trees in order to dig into the wood, they just lost that adaptation because it wasn't important for them anymore. It's hard to know for sure without a better fossil record of both these groups. And also because the Drapanosaurs are just so unique. When we're talking about how closely related different groups are, what we want to do is look for traits that are in common. And what that means is we take a bunch of characteristics. For example, we could say something like the bird-like skull. And we are going to give that a score of a 1. But if it doesn't have that and has what we think is the ancestral condition, the parent condition that's more of a general reptile condition, we can put that as a 0. And then you do this with a bunch of characteristics across all of the animal and a bunch of different animals, and you run it through a computer and the algorithm tells you, okay, this is the fewest number of steps that it would take to get this sort of a tree and this kind of a distribution of these different animals. And the thing is, intuitively, you go, oh, well then that means for the Drapanosaurs, it should be really easy because they're so unique. And you're wrong other than they all group together. We get all the Drapanosaurs to group together. We know that they're a single family and group of animals. The problem is they are so different from everything else that it's hard to say what else they're similar to because you don't count on the, how related they are based on their differences, but rather how similar they are. And Drapanosaurs are just so out there. Their bizarre arms, their bizarre skulls, their bizarre tails, everything about them doesn't help them line up with other groups. And the thing is, even within Drapanosaurs, we can tell that some of them are different from others, and in fact probably lived entirely different styles of lives. But because they still all share some of that same morphology, it's really, really hard to try and say what else they're related to. For example, we can take Skybolonyx from Petrified Forest and another undescribed animal from the BYU collections from the Saints and Sinners Quarry in the Triassic. Both of these were found to have probably had different lifestyles when compared with things like Drapanosaurus. The one from BYU, though, hasn't officially been published on. It was just during a talk at Society of Herbert Paleontology meeting that it was mentioned to have some particular traits. So I'm mostly going to focus on Skybolonyx since that one's already been discussed. Now, Skybolonyx is mostly just a handful of claws, large claws, kind of like Drapanosaurus, except these ones are wider and they have a groove which helps attach larger amounts of keratin to the claw. We can see this in some digging animals today. The thing is though, from what we can tell of Skybolonyx, it wasn't in the trees and it wasn't digging into trees looking for food. Instead, it seems much more likely based on the shapes of its claws that it was actually digging and at least lived a somewhat fossorial or burrowing lifestyle. In fact, the authors even commissioned this artwork of it coming out of a burrow in what would have been the fossil environment of Petrified Forest. So they're pretty confident that at least this animal was burrowing. And they actually ran a bunch of tests to try and help prove this. And they did a lot of tests to try and be able to show what exactly Skybolonyx was doing. And they did this by looking at multiple different measurements and trying to understand how it plots with modern day animals. And the thing is, they did this with a lot of Drapanosaurs as well. So the little diamonds, those are Drapanosaurus specimens, or at least parts of them. And what they found is that Drapanosaurus plots mostly with the arboreal tree climbing animals. There's a few outliers that start to approach fossorality. The thing is, a lot of these are really partial, so maybe some of those diamonds just aren't Drapanosaurus and are actually a different species. They're, they're really partial, it's hard to tell sometimes. But the thing is, Skybolonyx plots well within the fossorial group. It is very much a digging organism. But importantly, there's a difference between a digging organism, something that digs in the ground, and something that's entirely subterranean. Basically, you're going to be looking at the difference between something like a mole, which is going to be living its entire life underground, and you're going to be looking at the difference of something like an echidna, which do dig burrows, but they also feed above ground. It has the good ability to burrow, but that's not its main place where it spends all of its lifetime. But there is one Drapanosaur, Ancistronychus, which does actually show up in that subterranean category. So even though we can tell based on the claw morphology and some of the skull pieces 
and some of the arm morphology that Drapanosaurs are all really closely related to one another, they're still doing entirely different things. It's kind of wild to think about that they have so many adaptations that are in common with one another that led them to live entirely different lives from one to the other. It's not like they're all just sitting in one place going, okay, this is what works for us. They diverged and moved into many different groups. And there might be some hidden reasoning to their ability to get into all those different niches. So as I've said, it's really hard to try and nail down what exactly the Drapanosaurs were. And that kind of sucks for the title of the series, what the hell is it? Because I can really just go, some sort of reptile, but that's not a lot of help. And the thing is, again, people are still doing research on these animals. There's some people who suggest they're actually kind of closely related to things that had long necks and were swimmers, the Tanny Strophiates and this would have put them closer to archosaurs, meaning dinosaurs and crocodilians. There's also the group that mentioned they might be close to the Kineosauridae. And then there's finally a group that suggests they might be close to animals like the Wegeltosaurids. The Wegeltosaurids have also had a lot of research on them in the last few months. I think there's somebody probably doing a master's or a PhD on them, which is great because that gets us a lot of information about these very early reptiles. The Wegeltosaurids show up in the Permian. They are among the first reptile groups to really start to develop, and they were largely gliding animals. So if Trypanosaurs did start in the trees, maybe they were closely related to these. The thing is, that means that there's an entirely undiscovered lineage of Trypanosaurs that we just don't know about. Because if they did evolve near the Wegeltosaurids, that means that they would have shown up around 300 million years ago. The thing is, we don't have any Trypanosaur fossils to about 235 million years ago, meaning there's a 75 million year gap in their fossil record that we just don't know what to do with. So maybe that is the case, they were just mostly hidden, and then during the Triassic they survived that extinction and were able to diversify into many different forms. Alternatively, maybe they were close to the Tanistrophiids or the Kineosauridae. Both of these groups were very rapidly evolving during the Triassic and pretty much showed up at the beginning of the Triassic. So that could also be a reason for Japanosaurs not showing up earlier in the fossil record, they just didn't exist yet. There's a lot of debate about what exactly was going on with Japanosaurs, and I hope your main takeaway is just that biology can be kind of messy sometimes. It's not always a perfect understanding of what the organism is, because sometimes they're just really unique, and that makes it really hard to understand what exactly it was. Even if with things like Japanosaurus and Skybolonix, we can do really good tests that let us know what they were doing. So my answer for what the hell was it, I really don't have an answer this time, which sucks, I think Drapanosaurs are really, really interesting, but part of that interest is because they are so bizarre. And so what we really need to answer this question are some new fossils of early Drapanosaurs, things that share some traits in common with the Kineosauridae, or with the Tanistrophiids, or with the Wegeltosaurs. If we find one that has some traits in common with one of those groups, we might be better set to understand what the Drapanosaurs were and where exactly they evolved from and how quickly they developed their absolutely bizarre anatomy. One of the things that I would most like to see with Drapanosaurus is more studies on how its muscles worked, and that means getting into biomechanics, and that means getting into physics. And that's something I haven't done a ton of, which makes me happy to work with this video's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant.org offers thousands of courses on things like chemistry and physics, which are obviously great for paleontology and geology, but also calculus and statistics, which are great for any science. It's really one of the best places, if not the best place, to keep up to date and keep your brain working through a lot of these topics. So if you're trying to learn an entirely new subject or just stay up to date, it's a great tool to use. And on staying up to date, they're adding new lessons every month. So there's always something new to help you investigate how you want to learn about different topics even better. So for me, I'm using it because I'm going into paleontology, a pretty broad field, but even if you're going into something specific, it's a great place to continue learning. And you can get started for free by using the link below or by going to brilliant.org slash raptorchatter. And the first 200 people who use that link get 20% off their premium annual subscription. So be sure to go check it out. 